Hey guys, welcome back to Chemistry 1032 Instructional Videos. I am your professor, Dr. Russell Betts, and I'll be guiding you through 10.7, Factors That Affect Enzyme Activity. Simple enough. First things first. Substrate concentration affects activity. Pretty simple. I'm not sure what else to say about that. I'm just kidding. I know, what's, I know what to say. I'm just joking around. Basically, as the substrate concentration goes up, reaction activity goes up as well. Now, there's a limit to this. There's a limit to this. There's a limit at which the activity won't go any faster. The enzyme can't work any faster. But the concentration does matter. If the concentration is really low, the enzyme won't even be able to find the substrate. If there's the concentration is really high, the enzyme's maxed out. It can't go any faster. It can only do this certain point. So there's a sweet spot uh, called the steady state where the enzyme's working really well and uh, everything works out good. But if you're too low, the enzyme activity falls to zero. Because just think about that for a second. If, there, if you're an enzyme and there's nothing to react with, your reaction rate is zero because you can't react with anything because there's no one to react with. Make sense? pH. Now, we learned before that acids and bases will denature a protein. And enzymes are proteins, right? So there is a pH optimum for every enzyme in your body, okay? For every enzyme. Now, too high, pH too basic, denaturing, things slow down, okay? pH too low, again, things slow down, denaturing occurs. So pH matters when it comes to enzyme activity. I um, don't know what that was about. And this here are some examples of uh, enzymes in your body and their pHs they like to run at. Now notice... Here's a few that are quite basic, a few that are quite basic, and one right there that's quite acidic, pH 2. So it depends on what the enzyme does and where it's located in the body is the, the pH where it likes to work at, okay? Not every enzyme requires the same pH. Temperature, well, you know this one yourself, right? Um, you heat up a chemical reaction, they tend to go faster, okay? Well, there's a limit to that. Now, because we also know that enzymes are proteins, and proteins denature if you get them too warm. So there's a maximum for sure where you can take these things. Too hot, they denature. Now, obviously, if you go too cold, the enzyme will slow down to the point where it won't work anymore, okay? Because the kinetic energy is just not there to allow for a reaction, okay? So there is a temperature uh, sweet spot where the enzymes like to run. Probably in our body, around 37 is probably where they like to be. Could be more, it could be higher or lower depending on the enzyme. But it's a good bet, a good guess to say they like to run around 37. Too cold, they start shutting down. Too hot, they start shutting, they start to denature. And that's just how it is. And there's also these things called inhibitors. Hmm. Inhibitors prevent the active site from interacting with the substrate to form the enzyme substrate complex, the ES, the enzyme substrate complex. Inhibitors prevent this. Now, there's two ways they do it. Um, well, we'll get to that in a minute. First of all, there are two kinds of inhibitors, reversible and irreversible. Now, reversible inhibitors cause the enzyme to lose catalytic activity. If the inhibitor is removed, the enzyme goes back to work. So it doesn't kill the enzyme. It simply stops it for a moment while it's there. If you remove the inhibitor, things start happening again. Okay? Now, in reversal inhibition, there's two types. There's competitive and non-competitive inhibition. Competitive, non-competitive inhibition. For a competitive inhibitor, now here's what it means. The structure of the inhibitor resembles the substrate. The inhibitor, structure of the inhibitor resembles the substrate. Resembles the substrate. So they compete, both compete for the active site. So here's a substrate, here's an inhibitor. They both compete for the active site. That's why it's competitive. They both compete for the active site, okay? Now this is reversible again, so it can come back out. But that's what competitive inhibition means. They both compete for the active site, okay? Competitive inhibition, substrate and inhibitor both compete for the active site. I hope you wrote that down. Non-competitive inhibitors. Now in this situation, 
the inhibitor will not compete directly for the active site. The substrate can try to get in there if he wants to. The inhibitor will bind remotely from the active site. Now what happens when the inhibitor binds to the protein? It literally will change the shape of the active site. Think about when you hurt your back. If I'm sure you have. If you haven't, you will one day. Your time's coming. Um, when you hurt your back real bad, you can't walk. Your body's kind of twisted a little bit because things are not right. So think of a non-competitive inhibitor jumping on the enzyme's back and twisting it. So the structure is just not right and the catalytic activity stops. Okay? That's non-competitive inhibition. Competitive inhibition competes directly for the active site. It looks just like the substrate. Non-competitive inhibition binds somewhere else on the enzyme, twists the shape a little bit, prevents catalytic activity. That's non-competitive. Now, we have reversible, and now we have irreversible inhibitors. An irreversible inhibitor will form a covalent bond with an amino acid in the active site. It'll form a covalent bond with an amino acid in the active site. And once it does that, it's over. The, per the enzyme will no longer work. It will permanently inactivate the enzyme. Now, drugs are built like this. A lot, not all of them, some of them. Especially like penicillin, for example, is a great example of a drug that does this. Okay? It completely shuts down the catalytic activity. Antibiotics, like penicillin. They break up, they react with enzymes that actually help build cell walls for bacteria. And when they do that, the bacteria can no longer build its cell walls and it will eventually die. And that's eventually how you'll feel better, which is kind of nice, right? And this is irreversible inhibition. Irreversible inhibition. And that brings us to the end of chapter 10. Chapter 10 is not as heavy as other chapters. But the information is valuable. So make sure you understand it and make sure you can do it. Okay, guys? And uh, I think it's a fun chapter. I think there's a lot to learn here. And I think it's, it's very, very, very biologically relevant, which I'm sure a lot of you, you guys are here to do. Uh, you want to be uh, nurses or some other allied health profession. So I want to wish you good luck. And you know what I'm going to say next? Good chemistry. See you guys.